Hi, this is Scott Bradfield. This is uh, Reading Great Books in the Bathtub. I'm having trouble with these. Uh, the, I just lost did the whole lecture and it collapsed on me for some reason on the computer. So I'm a little frustrated. I hope I'm not showing it. And I'm going to try to do what I just finished doing, which was lost to technology. I want to talk today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite writers for the bathtub, uh, John Barth. And he's one of my favorite writers in the bathtub, in many ways, completely antithetically so to someone like Brian Moore. I want to talk a little bit about that today. So let's start. I want to start by just discussing some of the basic principles of telling stories, especially novels and narrative stories that uh, are kind of so, so basic to our awareness of reading fiction that we don't think about them. Most fiction, most good fiction, is con is chronological. It starts as this book starts, Black Row, with Le Father Le Forbe in Canada, awaiting uh, the government's permission to go into the wilderness and relieve another Jesuit missionary, and he's and to get the he's getting the the local natives to help him find his way there, and he's being given the go ahead. And it's about him making this decision to go into this wilderness and the people who are traveling with him. We start at the beginning. We don't go into long background stuff, and, you know, histories of Canada and the history of the Catholic Church, as big, fat, boring books do. We start at that moment, just as the story starts. In the course of the book, Lefort will develop over the course of several months. In the story. He will have a series of adventures and uh, he will suffer and he will realize things in chronological order until he reaches a certain crisis and the crisis in Black Robe is that Lefort begins to wonder why would I want to you know, save these people, they're savages, why would I save them? And he starts to question his own faith and his own purpose out here and then at the end, he comes to a realization about how he feels. And, and here's a guy who, you know, he believes in all this voodoo Catholic bullshit. And we sympathize with him because it's not about Catholicism. It's about an individual who wants to fulfill his beliefs and to help people. He ultimately wants to help people. We realize that, and he realizes that at the end of the book. So even though he's a character who we may not agree with, um, uh, we, we may not have sympathy, as I don't, for Catholicism. We have a great deal of sympathy for him, and we realize something about him. So there's a revelation, a revelation of the character and the nature of Lefort and this world he's gone into. Now, that's all, that's all, it is all kind of chronological. It's all sequential. And in the course of the book, we will have many flashbacks. Not a lot, but several flashbacks in which... Lefort will recall his life before he came to Canada. And there will be moments in his life in which he's reflecting. So they're not just out of the order. They're not put there to explain how he got to Canada. They're there because they kind of, they arise out of Lefort's experiences. And he remembers what his life was like before he came to Canada. So this is a sort of traditional narrative progress. It's the type of progress which we'll see in, you know, schlock entertainments, whether it's murder mysteries or, or science fiction or, or ro romance novels. It's also the standard uh, template for Chekhov and for Tolstoy and for um, the writer Flo Flaubert and for Alison Lurie and all the writers that we read to give us pleasure. It's just that it tends to be focused on the characters of the people in it. And we learn about Madame Bovary, or we learn about Father Laforgue, and at the end, it's our it's the, our quality of our feelings for these characters that that succeeds as, as as the pleasure of the novel. So there's the traditional way of telling a story. We're going to get to Barth, and a type of fiction that's often called metafiction. I hate these terms, uh, but he comes around in the '60s, Donald uh, John Barth, and his first books come out in the '50s, but he's he comes to prominence in the 60s and 70s, 
I think really is the best of that whole school of writers who included people like John Hawkes and Donald Barthelme and Robert Cover, all people who are kind of associated with that movement. Cortázar, the great, the great uh, Spanish writer, I think Spanish. Um, uh, Borges is sometimes connected to this group. Nabokov is certainly someone who associated with, is associated with this group. Um, but of the Americans, I think no one is better than Barth. And Barth uh, comes to fiction for, to do things very different than what Brain Moore does or what Chekhov does. He comes at it through these large encyclopedic compendiums, I would call them, of storytelling. Now, for example, in The Thousand and One Nights, a book that really influenced Barth when he was a young man, We've talked about this. We have the frame narrative, and I always forget how to spell it, of Shahrazad. You know it's serious when I get the when I get the old uh, whiteboard out. We're going to do some real serious teaching here, right? Okay, Shahrazad. Okay, and she's telling this king these sto a thousand and one stories. Remember the frame narrative, because he's an evil man who just wants to have sex with all these virgins and then kill them. And she tells him a story every night for a thousand and one nights, until, which teaches him to be a good king. So in the course of the thousand and one nights, he actually becomes a nicer man. And then ultimately, at the end of the story, he marries Shahrazad. So that's the frame narrative. Now, we have a development in that story. It's very simple. Bad guy becomes good guy. Tricky, smart woman gets, becomes queen. But we do not have the complexity of the, of the characters developing that we have in a Brian Moore novel. Nowhere near it. There's just basically a little, there's a gimmick here, and then they resolve it, and then we have the end of the book. Happy Ever After is the conclusion to that story. Not, not as complex as the ending of Black Row. In the course of the telling of these stories, the, the suspense is not in wondering what will happen to our character, so much as how are, we going, how are the stories going to end, and how are the stories going to be made complicated to the point where we can find our way out of them again? Does that make sense? For example, around 29th, the 29th night, there's a story of a hunchback. This is just one of the many examples of a hunchback. And this hunchback comes to this town, I've made it baby Baghdad, and he dies. And people, as he dies, he dies in front of people, like there's a Christian and there's a doctor and there's, I forget, there's a barber and so forth. And every time he, di he dies, people move him down the road because they don't want him dying on the, in their watch and they don't want to be blamed for it. So they keep moving him around and everybody thinks they killed him. So the joke is we have like nine characters he meets in the opening frame narrative. And I don't know, five, etc. And all of these characters are introduced in the opening narrative. And the hunchback's dead, and then the police show up. And the Shah, or some, I forget who he is, some, some big shot shows up. And he says, well, what's happened here? And he tries to solve the problem, and who he wants to punish the killer of the hunchback. In the course of his investigation, each of these people tells a story. We have one story from the, the Christian, and we have a story from the candlestick maker, we have a story from the, the butcher or whatever. Sometimes these stories will have five or six sub-stories inside them. And we will have to finish that sub-story to get back to the conclusion of that story, and then we move on to the next story. At the end of these eight or nine stories, I forget how many they are, we come back to the frame narrative of the hunchback, and the murder is solved by the big shot. And the murder is solved because the hunchback actually isn't dead. He comes back to life or something. And he runs off and, and all these people, this, this whole story vanishes. We don't learn anything about any of these characters. But we have a great time trying to keep track of the beginning, middle, and end of all these stories. At which point, we go right back to the Shahrazad story, the Shahrazad story, and she tells another sequence of tales. Each sequence is complicated in different ways. Okay, so you'll see what we're doing here is a completely different from the type of character-driven fiction that we talked about earlier. All right, let me get rid of this.
and talk about John Barth. And I got to keep an eye on this thing because I don't want this thing to shut down on me again. All right. John Barth starts off in the 50s writing two fairly simple novels, which he wrote them over the first of, over a course of a year. The first of which was The Floating Opera. And these are the most autobiographical or realistic of any of the novels he writes. They, they go off and they develop into hugely complicated narratives as he moves on from them in the 60s and the 70s. But the first two books are fairly conventional stories with a twist. And the twist is this kind of complicated narrative technique and technology that's sort of inhabiting uh, these, these stories, which drives all these stories. Now, let me show you some, from the very first book, The Floating Opera. We start off with a, a set of of um, ish. Another nest of telling stories. It starts off in the 1950s, and the guy's name is Todd Andrews, I think. Okay. And Todd Andrews, in the 1950s, is a 56-year-old man. 56-year-old man who's reflecting on his life, and who's writing a book, and he's writing this book. Okay, so it starts off as a man writing a book. And he's writing a book based on boxes of material he has been assembling since, I think, not, I can't remember, since 1930-ish. Because he started off working on something called the Inquiry. Right. In the course of working on this Inquiry, in 1937, he had a day in his life in which he decided not to kill himself. And in the course of writing this big book, this inquiry, he decides to focus on 1937 and tell that one day's story. In the course of telling that story, he tells his whole life. Right? Sorry, this is his whole life and his experiences in World War I, and so forth and so on. And it talks about how all this goes to make this decision, at which point we come back to the present day, to this man who's kind of an unhappy character and not a particularly interesting human being, but the technique of the story is what's interesting to Barth. Now, let me read a very brief passage from the opening of The Floating Opera. And it's when Todd is talking about writing this book, and he warns his readers, he says, Were you ever chagrined by stories that seemed to promise some revelation and then cheated their way out of it? Cheated their way out of it. Now, I'm going to argue that Moore never cheats his way out of it. We actually feel that we've got to know this character by the end of this book, and in most Moore novels we reach that feeling and that sense of revelation about our characters. For, for uh, Barth, in the same way in Shahrazad, the conclusion of the book is a cheat in a way. We're gonna, we're, there's no way we're going to conclude this story because it's not really about anything. We're just going to tell you the story and then we're going to kind of dazzle you at the end. Let me get, uh, this, the course of this story, we have a character who really basically decides that he doesn't believe in the notion of character. He, in, in, in the same way that the, it, more, Barth's second novel, The End of the Road, the character in that, the narrator, calls himself weatherless. He has no interior weather. He has no interior nature. Again, we get back to that existential argument that there's not a really interior character in that, that person. Um, and that you have, the first decision you have to make is whether you even want to be a person. So in the course of the inquiry that this man writes, he's, he's talking about how he changes and how his whole personality changes. And the biggest fear he has is a, a sound that he heard in World War I, in which he heard a, a bayonet he used to kill a man go into him and puncture that man. So the big fear, and that noise comes back throughout the book, is the fear of being punctured, of having this illusion of self just broken open. Now, in the course of the novel, it's a very entertaining book. It's, not a, it's got an intellectual premise, and the character in it is investigating a narrative premise, but it's basically a very funny novel about 
a menage a trois between the narrator and a couple he knows, and he's sleeping with his friend's wife, and it takes place over several years, and at the and he, they have a child, the, the couple has a child, which might be Todd's daughter, who he spends time with near the end, and then he comes to this decision not to kill himself, at which time we go back to the 1950s. All right. Now, having said all that, the pleasure of the book are these shifts and this kind of Nabokovian attention to detail and clarity of detail. There's a lot of satires on the fictions that we use to make our world seem real, um, legal fictions particularly in the course of this book, and because Todd Andrews is a lawyer, and the, the presumptions that we have to make ourselves real people. There's one character, a man, an old man, rich man, who saves all his poo and urine in, in, in jars and stuck, sticks them in the basement because he wants to preserve himself. Um, that's this type of joke that Barth finds interesting. In the course of the book, we, we eventually reach the floating opera, a metaphor for the book, which is that this opera travels down the Chesapeake. There's a complete story that's being told, but we just see parts of the story as they go past us. So perfectly okay narrative, a, a metaphor for narrative and how narrative works. And at the end of the book, we have a kind of 15 or 20 page chapter, which is a, we watch this ridiculous performance on the floating opera. And at the end, Todd says, and so I realized that it didn't matter if I kill myself or not, blah, blah. The book ends, and it's a really, really unsatisfying ending. Like many Barth conclusions of his books, we get into the nest of narratives, and the stories get very complicated, and eventually there's just complications. And he abandons the, the character and the interesting relationships that are in the story, and he just sort of lets them go. Um, that's, that's a problem with Barth, Barth's work. And I'm curious how, how I'm going to feel about reading him all, all the way through. I'm going to try to read his stuff from the beginning to the end. So we have that sense of dissatisfaction at the end. We didn't really arrive anywhere except we recognize that there's a metaphor for the fiction being a contraption that kind of entertains us and dazzles us and gives us pleasure. And then when it's gone, it's just a contraption. And there is that feeling in almost all of his books. So as we move into his books, as they get... They get longer and more complicated. Eventually, we reach books like Letters, which is a huge epistolary novel in which all of Barth's previous characters up until this time in the 70s, 1979, all his previous characters correspond with one another, for example. Or we have his largest takeoff on the Thousand and One Nights, The Last Voyage of Somebody, the Sailor, which goes back and forth from Sinbad-type character to... Um, often goes back to Barth, who becomes a character in his own fiction. So recognizing the the primacy of fiction and the, ultimately the hollowness of the fiction, that there's no real treasure in fiction. One of the lines he uses most often is, the key to the treasure is the treasure. So you, you're never going to find the treasure, but, but going in search of the treasure is the pleasure. Finding your way in and out of these narrative uh, vortices is the fun. It's like a, It's a treasure hunt. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at there. I'm going to try to, uh, over the next thousand and one nights of my life, return to Barth. I enjoy reading him and thinking about how he writes stories. He's also a good narrative technician, and he has actually really interesting characters. They're very moving, sometimes very funny, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy reading him. So we'll start, try to work our way through up semi-sequentially as we go. Okay, I hope this worked, and... Uh, We'll see you in the bathtub.